Okay, well, thank you. We're going to move on now. We have one of our distinguished fellows, uh, Ryan Master, who's going to come up and present a case, and his case is evaluation of mitral regurgitation and assessment of reduction via the percutaneous approach. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Nice to be here again. Um, Joe mentioned my talk. I have nothing uh, to disclose. we get on to the case here. A uh, 42-year-old gentleman with a chief complaint of life-limiting uh, dyspnea on exertion and some atypical chest pain. Um, history, hypertension, tobacco use, and then a heavy family history of cardiac disease, heart failure, and sudden cardiac death. Uh, going over his cardiac history, initially in 2008, he had an MI, PCI to the CERT, and right coronary was done. And then subsequently at another outside institution in 2011, he had PCI to his right coronary. He presented in 2012 with heart failure, low EF, with uh, severe mitral regurgitation noted at that point. And uh, on repeat angiography, had really no significant uh, notable disease at, at that time. <clears throat> he continued to have uh, multiple heart failure admissions, uh, as heart failure classification, NYHA class three, and was on maximal tolerated therapy. His echo, similar to what it was before, still showed severely dilated low EF, and severe MR. And then, on, to note extra on that, cardiac MRI had shown that his trabeculations, which were just thought to be prominent, were more consistent with LV non-compaction. Cath was repeated, which did show that he still had some uh, moderate to significant coronary disease. IFR of his LAD was 0.86, which is classified as significant for ischemia. And then he had some incident restenosis in the right coronary and on stress testing, also infralaterally. Get all these videos to show. So in the uh, top, uh, you see a four chamber on the TTE. The rest of them are TE images. Uh, as you clearly see, the severe MR that, that's being shown. A little bit of a posterior re restriction, uh, and so the MR is more posterior jet. Again, some more, more views of the, the mitral regurgitation there, and you clearly see a little bit of an eccentric jet there. Hemodynamics, uh, this was uh, about a year before he actually had his intervention on his mitral valve. Um, mild pulmonary hypertension, really all generated by elevated volume with a wedge of 23. And as, you, as you'll see there, notable V waves, as we see in mitral regurgitation, up to, up to 40, and a very low cardiac index. And so just some, go over some key points with the mitral regurgitation with the panel, so what and how this gentleman fits in, which will impact our, uh, our treatment for him. So obviously chronic, not acute. Uh, the etiology of him is, is a secondary uh, related to his dilated cardiomyopathy, questionable whether ischemia is part of that cause, and then severity of how we uh, evaluate MR, mostly on TEE, and then uh, as well as cath, where you can do an LV gram, and all of his fit with uh, this chronic severe presentation. So uh, for him, the question is what next uh, to do for, for treatment in this gentleman? How does he go? Here, so he really fits in this arm, secondary MR, coronary disease, symptomatic, persistent. So 2B recommendation for surgery, as well as he still has unrevascularized un coronary disease, so 2A, 2A recommendation uh, at that point. So the recommendation that we did was that uh, cabbage versus uh, mitral valve surgery. However, uh, when he was evaluated by the cardiothoracic surgeons, was felt not to be an ideal candidate for surgery. They had concern about his LV non-compaction and that potentially uh, being a higher risk as well as his overall STS score for morbidity and mortality was ra rather high. So he ended up getting revascularized via percutaneous approach in uh, December 2014. Unfortunately, still remained having symptomatic with recurrent uh, admissions. So at, at this point, uh, other, other options for this person um, kind of talk about what we, what we discussed earlier, that um, mitral clip uh, fits in that. Mitral clip approved, approved in uh, the U.S. for degenerative MR, which again, he, he falls out of that, but uh, he uh, does uh, fall, have functional MR, which it is frequently used for, and a little bit on the data 
here. So this was from the Everest II trial, which was comparing uh, mitral clip versus surgery for the mitral valve and not high-risk patients, just overall in, in general. And this is looking at one-year and four-year outcomes. And you can see here baseline and then at 12 months uh, improvement in NYHA class in, uh, with the device. And then this is with surgery. Surgery had better results as well as significantly better results in MR reduction. But you do see that there was benefit with the mitral clip, just inferior to surgery. Again, at four years, you still see NYHA class benefit as well as MR severity benefit. Again, inferior to surgery, but if you have no alternatives, uh, it is something to, to evaluate. And then um, the COAP trial will look at functional MR in a little more detail, but functional MR was included in the Everest trial. And you actually see here in subgroup analysis, obviously limitations to subgroup analysis, but that the functional patients tended to do better with percutaneous repair. And if you see in Europe, the majority of patients undergoing mitral clip are for functional MR. Another uh, study uh, looking at patients more in the real world, high-risk patients, 70% functional, having a significant benefit in their New York Heart Association class. So with this, we decided to go forward with uh, mitral clip. And actually, this was, he had very impressive v -ways. So this is the left atrial uh, pressure tracing with the catheter in, in the left atrium. So your A wave here, and then the V wave substantial. So the guy obviously has elevated uh, left atrial uh, pressures, uh, which is indicative of elevated LVDP, but huge, huge V waves that, that are seen. Again, not to uh, reiterate, uh, Jeff Hastings uh, showed this earlier. This is how the clip goes in, implanted, and this guy also required a second clip, which a significant amount of patients do require more than, more than one clip to be done. So 3D imaging of the clip being placed after one clip is being placed. So it's this end-to-end -end anastomosis. So you see the mitral valve still, still opens, has actually two holes. And it's important to assess, especially when you're evaluating for a second clip, uh, any gradient for mitral stenosis, so minimal gradient that he had there. And then post-clip, post if we get these going, a nice, nice reduction in his MR. Some of these may miss some of the JET uh, on, on other uh, TTE afterwards. He still had moderate mitral regurgitation afterwards. But as you can see, a nice, nice significant benefit after both, both clips placed there. And then impressively, his left atrial pressure tracing, like someone with a dilated cardiomyopathy, as uh, V waves quite quite normal, and then they left it in the A wave should be a little bit higher, and it goes, so fits an impressive, impressive reduction showing that the clip was, was effective. And then follow up, uh, he's doing, doing all right, still has some symptoms, but much, much improved. And interestingly, uh, relating to what Dr. Collins was talking about, his LV function on echo stayed, stayed about the same. Question? 